Welcome to this evening's performance of The People Speak. The show will begin shortly. Welcome back, everyone. I have to say the lessons I took part in today were just exceptional. I learned so much and I hope you did too, and that you feel excited and motivated and encouraged to continue on in the struggle. There is no doubt we are living in an unprecedented time that will be remembered and examined in the history books. The words we hear on the nightly news or the tweets that are shared or the speeches that our elected officials or labor leaders, our activists and us in the nurses are making at our memorials, our protest and in the halls of Congress will be shared for generations to come. And tonight we take a break from making news for a time to look backwards at the history makers of years gone by those, in the words of John Lewis, made good trouble. Tonight, we are so excited to bring you what is always a crowd pleaser, the People Speak performance, where history plays out literally before your eyes and ears. For those who have not seen a People Speak performance before, let me explain. People Speak is a dramatic reading, selected speeches, testimonies, poems, letters, and manifestos of people throughout the U.S. history who have built the movements to end slavery, racism, war, oppression, and exploitation. We are joined tonight by an esteemed group of actors, spoken word artists, musicians, who will bring to life the eloquent history of political struggle and protest in a performance that is inspired historian Howard Zinn's legendary book, A People's History of the United States. Joining us now is Oscar nominated Jesse Eisenberg to tell us more. So here we go. Uh, thank you so much. Um, good evening, I'm Jesse Eisenberg. I'm honored to be narrating tonight's performance of The People Speak. Please join me in thanking and welcoming our brilliant performers this evening. Bluebird, Stacey Ann Chin, Megalyn Echikunwoke, Diane Guerrero, Ben Harper, Brian Jones, Simone Missick, Kendrick Sampson, Wallace Shawn, Lily Tomlin, and Jesse Williams. The great abolitionist Frederick Douglass wrote these words in 1857, but they speak directly to our moment today. Let me give you a word on the philosophy of reform. The whole history of the progress of human liberty shows that all concessions yet made to her august claims have been born of earnest struggle. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. This struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Find out just what any people will quietly submit to, and you have found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong that will be imposed on them. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. Power concedes nothing without a demand. Never did, and it never will. In 1886, a meeting was called for Haymarket Square in Chicago to protest the killing of four strikers at the McCormick Harvester Works the day before. After a bomb exploded during the demonstration, eight Chicago anarchists were arrested, tried, and sentenced to death. Four of the eight, later known as the Haymarket Martyrs, were executed, among them August Spears. Your Honor, in addressing this court, I speak as the representative of one class to the representative of another. I have been indicted on the charge of murder as an accomplice or accessory. Upon this indictment, I have been convicted. 
There was no evidence produced by the state to show or even indicate that I had any knowledge of the man who threw the bomb, or that I myself had anything to do with the throwing of the missile. Unless, of course, you weigh the testimony of the accomplices of the state's attorney by the price they were paid for it. If there was no evidence to show that I was legally responsible for the deed, then my conviction and the execution of the sentence is nothing less than willful, malicious, and deliberate murder. There have been many judicial murders committed where the representatives of the state were acting in good faith, believing their victims to be guilty of the charge accused of. In this case, the representatives of the state cannot shield themselves with a similar excuse. For they themselves have fabricated most of the testimony which was used as a pretense to convict us, to convict us by a jury picked out to convict. Before this court and before the public, which is supposed to be the state, I charge the state's attorney with the heinous conspiracy to commit murder. If the opinion of the court given this morning is good law, then there is no person in this country who could not lawfully be hanged. Upon that law, every person in this country can be indicted for conspiracy, and as the case may be, for murder. Every member of a trade union, Knights of Labor, or any other labor organization can then be convicted of conspiracy and in cases of violence, for which they may not be responsible at all, of murder, as we have been. But if you think that by hanging us, you can stamp out the labor movement, the movement from which the downtrodden millions, the millions who toil and live in want and misery, the wage slaves, expect salvation. If this is your opinion, then hang us. Here you will tread upon a spark, but there, and there, and behind you, and in of you, and everywhere, flames will blaze up. It is a subterranean fire. You cannot put it out. In 1937, a Bronx school teacher, Abel Mirpol, saw a gruesome picture of two black teenagers who had been lynched in Marion, Indiana, and wrote the haunting poem, Bitter Fruit. Mirpol published the words to the song in the New York Teacher, but fame for the song came after Mirpol showed it to the extraordinary blues singer, Billie Holiday. Though her record company refused to record the song, she released it through a specialty label under the title Strange Fruit. Southern trees bear a strange fruit, blood on the leaves and blood at the root, black bodies swinging in the southern breeze, strange fruit. From the poplar tree Pastoral scene Of a gallant sound bulging eyes and a twisted mouth 
scent of magnolia, sweet and fresh. Then the sudden smell of burning flesh. Here is a fruit for the crow to blood. For the rain to gather, for the winter sun, for the sun to rise, for the tree to drop. Here is a strange and bitter. While some civil rights leaders urged a more cautious approach to winning civil rights, Malcolm X expressed the feelings of many Blacks that more uncompromising methods of struggle were needed. Here is an excerpt of a speech Malcolm X delivered in Detroit, Michigan in 1963. We want to have just an off-the-cuff chat between you and me, us. We want to talk right down to earth in a language that everybody here can easily understand. We all agree tonight that America has a very serious problem. Not only does America have a very serious problem, but our people have a very serious problem. America's problem is us. We are her problem. The only reason she has a problem is she doesn't want us here. Once you face this as a fact, then you can start plotting a course that will make you appear intelligent instead of unintelligent. What you and I need to do is learn to forget our differences. You don't catch hell because you're a Methodist or a Baptist. You don't catch hell because you're a Democrat or a Republican. And you sure don't catch hell because you're an American, because if you were an American, you wouldn't catch hell. You catch hell because you're a black man. You catch hell, all of us catch hell for the same reason. So we're all black people, so-called Negroes, second-class citizens, ex-slaves. You're nothing but an ex-slave. You don't like to be told that, but what else are you? You are ex-slaves. You didn't come here on the Mayflower. You came here on a slave ship in chains. We have a common enemy. We have this in common. We have a common oppressor, a common exploiter. But once we all realize that we have a common enemy, then we unite on the basis of what we have in common. And what we have foremost in common is that enemy, the white man. I know some of you all think that some of them aren't enemies. Time will tell. Look at the American Revolution in 1776. That revolution was for what? For land. Why did they want land? Independence. How was it carried out? Bloodshed. You haven't got a revolution that doesn't involve bloodshed, but you're afraid to bleed. As long as the white man sent you to Korea, you bled. He sent you to Germany, you bled. He sent you to fight the Japanese, you bled. You bleed when the white man says bleed. You bite when the white man says bite, and you bark when the white man says bark. I hate to say this about us, but it's true. How can you justify being nonviolent in Mississippi and Alabama when your churches are being bombed and your little girls are being murdered? If violence is wrong in America, violence is wrong abroad. And if it is right for America to draft us and teach us how to be violent in defense of her, then it is right for you and me to do whatever is necessary to defend our own people. Fannie Lou Hamer co-founded the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party in 1964, along with Ella Baker and Bob Moses. She delivered this speech later that year at a rally with Malcolm X at the Williams Institutional CME Church in Harlem. 
My name is Fannie Lou Hamer, and I exist at 626 East Lafayette Street in Ruleville, Mississippi. The reason I say exist is because we are excluded from everything in Mississippi but the tomb and the graves. Instead of the land of the free and the home of the brave, Mississippi is the land of the tree and the home of the grave. It was the 31st of August of 1962 that 18 of us traveled 26 miles to the county courthouse in Indianola, Mississippi to try to register to become first class citizens. It was the 31st of August in 1962 that I was fired for trying to become a first class citizen. When we got to Indianola, we was met by the state highway patrolman, the city policeman. As some of you know that have worked in Mississippi, any white man that is able to wear a pair of khaki pants without them falling off of them and hold two guns can make a good law officer. After taking this literacy test, some of you have seen it, we have 21 questions. By whom are you employed? So we can be fired by the time we get back home. Have you ever been convicted of any of the following crimes? After finishing this form, we started on this trip back to Ruleville, Mississippi, and we were stopped by the same city policeman that I had seen in Indianola and a state highway patrolman. We was ordered to get off the bus. After we got off the bus, we was ordered to get back on the bus and told to go back to Indianola. When we got back to Indianola, the bus driver was charged with driving a bus of the wrong color. This same bus had been used year after year to haul people to the cotton fields to pick cotton. But this day, for the first time that this bus had been used for voter registration, it had the wrong color. On the 10th of September in 1962, 16 bullets were fired into the home of Mr. and Mrs. Robert Tucker, where I'd been living. That same night, two girls were shot in Ruleville. They also shot Mr. Joe McDonald's home that same night. What I am trying to point out now is when you take a very close look at this American society, it's time to question these things. You always hear this long sob story. You know it takes time. For 300 years, we have given them time. And I have been tired so long. Now I am sick and tired of being sick and tired and we want to change. We want a change in this society, in America, because you see, we can no longer ignore the facts, getting our children to sing, oh say, can you see? By the dawn's early light, what so proudly we hailed, what do we have to hail here? A lot of people will roll their eyes at me today but I'm gonna tell you just like it is, you see? Because we are not free. And you know we are not free. You are not free in Harlem. The people are not free in Chicago because I've been there too. They are not free in Philadelphia because I have been there too. I have gone to a lot of big cities and I have got my first city to go to where a man wasn't standing with his feet on the black man's neck. The truth is the only thing gonna free us. There is so much hypocrisy in this society. And if we want America to be a free society, we have to stop telling lies.
1966, with the war in Vietnam escalating rapidly, Muhammad Ali, the world heavyweight boxing champion, petitioned for exemption from military service. When this was denied, he refused to be drafted. His title was taken away from him, and he was sentenced to a five-year prison term. He appealed all the way to the Supreme Court, and in 1971, his conviction was finally reversed. In 1966, Ali spoke in Louisville, Kentucky, his hometown, about the reasons for not fighting in Vietnam. Why should they ask me to put on a uniform and go 10,000 miles from home and drop bombs and bullets on brown people in Vietnam while so-called Negro people in Louisville are treated like dogs and denied simple human rights? No, I'm not going 10,000 miles from home to help murder and burn another poor nation simply to continue the domination of white slave masters of the darker people the world over? This is the day when such evils must come to an end. I have been warned that to take such a stand would put my prestige in jeopardy and could cause me to lose millions of dollars which should accrue to me as the champion. But I have said it once and I will say it again. The real enemy of my people is right here. I will not disgrace my religion, my people, or myself by becoming a tool to enslave those who are fighting for their own justice, freedom, and equality. If I thought the war was going to bring freedom and equality to 22 million of my people, they wouldn't have to draft me. I'd join tomorrow. But I either have to obey the laws of the land or the laws of Allah. I have nothing to lose by standing up for my beliefs. So I'll go to jail. We've been in jail for 400 years. A number of civil rights leaders urged the civil rights leader, Martin Luther King Jr., not to speak out on the growing intervention of the United States in Vietnam. But in a speech he gave in the Riverside Church in New York exactly one year before his assassination, King powerfully denounced the unjust war. I come to this magnificent house of worship tonight because my conscience leaves me no other choice. A time comes when silence is betrayal. That time has come for us in relation to Vietnam. Over the past two years, as I have moved to break the betrayal of my own silences and to speak from the burnings of my own heart, many persons have questioned me about the wisdom of my path. Why are you speaking about the war, Dr. King? Why are you joining the voices of dissent? Peace and civil rights don't mix, they say. And when I hear them, though I often understand the source of their concern, I am nevertheless greatly saddened for such questions mean that the inquirers have not really known me, my commitment, or my calling. Indeed, their questions suggest that they do not know the world in which they live. There is at the outset a very obvious and almost facile connection between the war in Vietnam and the struggle I and others have been waging in America. A few years ago, there was a shining moment in that struggle. It seemed as if there was a real promise of hope for the poor, both black and white, through the poverty program. There were experiments, hopes, new beginnings. Then came the buildup in Vietnam, and I watched this program broken and eviscerated as if it were some idle political plaything of a society gone mad on war. Perhaps a more tragic recognition of reality took place when it became clear to me that the war was doing far more than devastating the hopes of the poor at home. It was sending their sons and their brothers and their husbands to fight and to die in extraordinarily high proportions relative to the rest of the population. We have been repeatedly faced with the cruel irony of watching Negro and white boys on TV screens as they kill and die together for a nation that has been unable to seat them together in the same schools. So we watched them in brutal solidarity, burning the huts of a poor village, but we realized that they would hardly live on the same block in Chicago. As I have walked among desperate, 
rejected and angry young men. I have told them that Molotov cocktails and rifles would not solve their problems. I have tried to offer them my deepest compassion while maintaining my conviction that social change comes most meaningfully through nonviolent action. But they asked, and rightly so, what about Vietnam? They asked if our own nation wasn't using massive doses of violence to solve its problems, to bring about the changes it wanted. Their questions hit home. And I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. The war in Vietnam is but a symptom of a far deeper malady within the American spirit. And if we ignore this sobering reality, we will find ourselves organizing clergy and layman concerned committees for the next generation. They will be concerned about Guatemala and Peru. They will be concerned about Thailand and Cambodia. They will be concerned about Mozambique and South Africa. We will be marching for these and dozens of other names and attending rallies without end unless there is a significant and profound change in American life and policy. So such thoughts take us beyond Vietnam. I'm convinced that if we are to get on the right side of the world revolution, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When machines and computers, profit motives, and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. A true revolution of values will soon look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth and say, this is not just. A true revolution of values will lay hand on the world order and say of war, this way of settling differences is not just. This, this business of burning human beings with napalm, of filling our nation's homes with orphans and widows, of injecting poisonous drugs of hate into the veins of people normally humane cannot be reconciled with wisdom justice and love. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. America, the richest and most powerful nation in the world, can well lead the way in this revolution of values. There is nothing except a tragic death wish to prevent us from reordering our priorities so the pursuit of peace will take precedence over the pursuit of war. There is nothing, nothing to keep us from molding a recalcitrant status quo with bruised hands until we have fashioned it into a brotherhood. The brilliant writer James Baldwin wrote this public letter to Angela Davis on November 19th, 1970. Dear sister, one might have hoped that by this hour, the very sight of chains on black flesh, or the very sight of chains, would be so intolerable a sight for the American people and so unbearable a memory that they would themselves spontaneously rise up and strike off the manacles. But no, they appear to glory in their chains. Now, more than ever, they appear to measure their safety in their chains and corpses. Well, since we live in an age in which silence is not only criminal but suicidal, I've been making as much noise as I can here in Europe, on radio and television. Very probably an exercise in futility, but one must not let opportunity slide. I am something like 20 years older than you, of that generation, therefore, of which George Jackson ventures that there are no healthy brothers, none at all. End quote. 
What has happened, it seems to me, and to put it far too simply, is that a whole new generation of people have assessed and absorbed their history, and in that tremendous action, have freed themselves of it, and will never be victims again. When Cassius Clay became Muhammad Ali and refused to put on that uniform, a very different impact was made on the people, and a very different kind of instruction had begun. The American triumph, in which the American tragedy has always been implicit, was to make black people despise themselves. When I was little, I despised myself. I did not know any better, and this meant, albeit unconsciously, or against my will or in great pain, that I also despised my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters. One way of gauging a nation's health or of discerning what it really considers to be its interests, or to what extent it can be considered as a nation, as distinguished from a coalition of special interests, is to examine those people it elects to represent it and protect it. One glance at the American leaders, or figureheads, conveys that America is on the edge of absolute chaos, and also suggests the future to which American interests, if not the bulk of the American people, appear willing to consign the blacks. Indeed, one look at our past conveys that. It is clear that for the bulk of our nominal countrymen, we are all expendable. As long as white Americans take refuge in their whiteness, for so long as they are unable to walk out of this most monstrous of traps, they will allow millions of people to be slaughtered in their name and will be manipulated into and surrender themselves to what they will think of a justifiable racial war. Only a handful of the millions of people in this vast place are aware that the fate intended for you, Sister Angela, and for George Jackson, and for the numberless prisoners in our concentration camps, for that is what they are, is a fate which is about to engulf them too. White lives for the forces which rule in this country are no more sacred than black ones. As many and many a student is discovering, as the white American corpses in Vietnam prove, we must do what we can do and fortify and save each other. We know that air and water belong to all mankind and not merely to industrialists. We know that a baby does not come into the world merely to be the instrument of someone else's profit. We know that a democracy does not mean the coercion of all into a deadly and, finally, wicked mediocrity, but the liberty for all to aspire to be the best that is in him or her and that has ever been. We know that we, the blacks, and not only we, the blacks, have been here and are the victims of a system whose only fuel is greed, whose only God is profit. We know that the fruits of this system have been ignorance, despair, and death, and we know that the system is doomed because the world can no longer afford it, if indeed it ever could have. And we know that for the perpetuation of this system, we have all been mercilessly brutalized and have been told nothing but lies, lies about ourselves and our kinsmen and our past and about love, life and death, so that both soul and body have been bound in hell. The enormous revolution in black consciousness which has occurred in your generation, my dear sister, means the beginning or the end of America. Some of us, white and black, know how great a price has already been paid to bring into existence a new consciousness, a new people, an unprecedented nation. If we know and do nothing, we are worse than the murderers hired in our name. If we know 
that we must fight for your life as though it were our own, which it is. For if they take you in the morning, they'll be coming for us that night. Therefore, peace. James Baldwin. And here are the words of the great historian Howard Zinn, whose work inspired tonight's program. I start from the supposition that the world is topsy-turvy, that things are all wrong, that the wrong people are in jail and the wrong people are out of jail. The wrong people are in power and the wrong people are out of power. Yet the wealth is distributed in this country and the world in such a way as not simply to require small reform, but to require a drastic reallocation of wealth. I start from the supposition that we don't have to say too much about this because all we have to do is think about the state of the world today and realize that things are all upside down. Daniel Berrigan is in jail, a Catholic priest, a poet who opposes the war, and J. Edgar Hoover is free, you see. At Kent State University, four students were killed by the National Guard and students were indicted. So we have to start from that supposition that things are really topsy-turvy and our topic is topsy-turvy, civil disobedience. As soon as you say the topic is civil disobedience, you are saying our problem is civil disobedience. That is not our problem. Our problem is civil obedience. Our problem is the numbers of people all over the world who have obeyed the dictates of the leaders of their government and have gone to war and millions have been killed because of this obedience. We have to transcend these national boundaries in our thinking. Nixon and Brezhnev have much more in common with one another than we have with Nixon. J. Edgar Hoover has far more in common with the head of the Soviet secret police than he has with us. That's why we're always surprised when they get together. They smile, they shake hands, they smoke cigars. They really like one another, no matter what they say. What we're trying to do, I assume, is really to get back to the principles and aims and spirit of the Declaration of Independence. This spirit is resistance to illegitimate authority and to forces that deprive people of their life and liberty and right to pursue happiness. And therefore, under these conditions, it urges the right to alter or abolish the, their current form of government. And the stress had been on abolish. But to establish the principles of the Declaration of Independence, we're, we're going to need to go outside the law. My hope is that this kind of spirit will take place not just in this country, but in other countries, because they all need it. People in all countries need the spirit of disobedience to the state. And we need a kind of declaration of interdependence among people in all countries of the world who are striving for the same thing. In 1970, when students at Kent State University in Ohio assembled on the campus green to protest the expansion of the Vietnam War into Cambodia, National Guardsmen opened fire, killing four students and paralyzing another for life. The incident inspired Neil Young to immediately write, record, and release with Crosby, Stills, and Nash the protest song, Ohio.
The picking poet Adrian Rich, an outspoken feminist and lesbian, wrote these words in the afterword for the paperback edition of her classic book of Woman Born. To seek visions, to dream dreams is essential. And it is also essential to try new ways of living, to make room for serious experimentation, to respect the effort even where it fails. I am convinced that there are ways of thinking that we don't yet know about. I take those words to mean that many women are even now thinking in ways which traditional intellectual denies, describes, or is unable to grasp. Thinking is an active, fluid, expanding process. Intellection, knowing, are recapitulations of past processes. In arguing that we have been by no means yet explored or understood our biological grounding, the miracle and the paradox of the female body and its spiritual and political meanings I am really asking whether women cannot begin at last to think through the body, to connect what has been so cruelly disorganized, our great mental capacities hardly used, our highly developed tactile sense, our genius for close observation, our complicated, pain-enduring, multi-pleasured physicality. I know of no woman for whom the body is not a fundamental problem. Its clouded meanings, its fertility, its desire, its so-called frigidity, its bloody speech, its silences, its changes and mutilations, its rapes and ripenings. There is for the first time today a possibility of converting our physicality into both knowledge and power. Physical motherhood is merely one dimension of our being. We need to imagine a world in which ever woman is the presiding genius of her own body. In such a world, women will truly create life, bring forth not only children, if we choose, but the visions and the thinking necessary to sustain, console, and alter human existence, a new relationship to the universe. Sexuality, politics, intelligence, power, motherhood, work, community, intimacy will develop new meanings. Thinking itself will be transformed. This is where we have to begin. Audre Lorde was a self-described black lesbian mother warrior poet who challenged many interlocking forms of oppression in her life and work. She wrote these words in the revolutionary 1985 book, Sister Outsider. As we become more in touch with our ancient black non-European view of living as a situation to be experienced and interacted with, we learn more and more to cherish our feelings, to respect those hidden sources of power from where true knowledge and therefore lasting action comes. At this point in time, I believe that women carry within ourselves the possibility for fusion of these approaches as keystone for survival and we become closest to this combination in our poetry. I speak here of poetry as the revelation or distillation of experience, not the sterile wordplay that too often the white fathers distorted the words poetry to mean in order to cover their desperate wish for imagination without insight. For women then, poetry is not a luxury. It is a vital necessity of our existence. It forms the quality of the light within which we predicate our hopes and dreams towards survival and change. First made into language, then into idea, then into more tangible action. Poetry is the way we help to name 
the nameless. So it can be thought, the farthest external horizons of our hopes and fears are cobbled by our poems, carved from the rock experiences of our daily lives. As they become known and accepted to ourselves, our feelings and the honest exploration of them, they become sanctuaries and fortresses and spawning grounds for the most radical and daring of ideas, the house of difference so necessary to change and the conceptualization of any meaningful action. Right now, I could name at least 10 ideas I would have once found intolerable or incomprehensible and frightening, except after they came after dreams and poems. This is not idle fantasy, but the true meaning of it feels right to me. We can train ourselves to respect our feelings and to discipline them into language that matches those feelings so they can be shared. And where that language does not yet exist, it is our poetry which helps to fashion it. Poetry is not only dream or vision. Poetry is the skeleton architecture of our lives. Experience has taught us that the action in the now is also always necessary. Our children cannot dream unless they live. They cannot live unless they are nourished. And who else will feed them the real food without which their dreams will be no different from ours? Sometimes we drug ourselves with dreams of new ideas. The head will save us. The brain alone will set us free. But there are no new ideas still waiting in the wings to save us as women, as human. There are only old and forgotten ones, new combinations, extrapolations, and recognitions from within ourselves, along with a renewed courage to try them out. And we must constantly encourage ourselves and each other to attempt the heretical actions or dreams imply and some of the old ideas disparage. In the forefront of our move towards change, there is only our poetry to hint at possibility made real. Women have survived as poets. And there are no new pains. We have felt them all already. We have hidden the fact in the same place where we have hidden our power. They lie in our dreams. And it is in our dreams that point our way to freedom. They are made realizable through our poems that give us the strength and the courage to see, to feel, to speak, and to dare. In 1988, Vito Russo, a founding member, member of ACT UP, spoke at a rally in New York about the fight against AIDS and homophobia. A friend of mine in New York City has a half fare transit card, which means that you can get on buses and subways for half price. And the other day, when he showed his card to the token attendant, the attendant asked what his disability was, and he said, I have AIDS. And the attendant said, no, you don't. If you had AIDS, you'd be home dying. And so I wanted to speak out today as a person who has AIDS, who is not dying. You know, for the last three years since I was diagnosed, my family thinks two things about my situation. One, they think I'm going to die. And two, they think that my government is doing absolutely everything in their power to stop that. And they're wrong on both counts. If I'm dying from anything, I'm dying from homophobia. If I'm dying from anything, I'm dying from racism. If I'm dying from anything, it's from indifference and red tape, because these are the things that are preventing an end to this crisis. If I'm dying from anything, I'm dying from Jesse Helms. If I'm dying from anything, I'm dying from the President of the United States. 
and especially if I'm dying from anything, I'm dying from the sensationalism of newspapers and magazines and television shows which are interested in me as a human interest story only as long as I'm willing to be a helpless victim, but not if I'm fighting for my life. If I'm dying from anything, I'm dying from the fact that not enough rich, white, heterosexual men have gotten AIDS for anybody to give a shit. You know, living with AIDS in this country is like living in the twilight zone. Living with AIDS is like living through a war, which is happening only for those people who happen to be in the trenches. Every time a shell explodes, you look around and you discover that you've lost more of your friends. But nobody else notices. It isn't happening to them. They're walking through the streets as though we weren't living through some kind of nightmare. And only you can hear the screams of the people who are dying and their cries for help. No one else seems to be noticing. Someday the AIDS crisis will be over. Remember that. And when that day comes, when that day is come and gone, there will be people alive on this earth, gay people and straight people, men and women, black and white, who will hear the story that once there was a terrible disease in this country and all over the world, and that a brave group of people stood up and fought and in some cases gave their lives so that other people might live. And we have to commit ourselves to doing that. And then, after we kick the shit out of this disease, we're all going to be alive to kick the shit out of this system so that this never happens again. This song, which first appeared on the African-American singer-songwriter and activist Tracy Chapman's debut album in 1988, has become one of the iconic protest songs of our era. Roberto Meneses Marquez is the president of Day Laborers United, a group working for the rights of workers in the precarious day labor industry, many of them undocumented. Even before the virulently anti-immigrant policies of President Trump, he spoke out against the policies of the Obama era.
I am an undocumented day laborer in Queens who has worked in this country for almost 20 years. I do hard, dangerous jobs on construction sites, such as demolition or carrying out the trash when I can get any work at all. I have known many men who have been killed in the workplace accidents or who have become gravely ill from breathing in dust due to a lack of adequate protective equipment. We deserve a chance to become full members of the society we contribute to every day. For the past decade, I have heard much in the media about possible immigration reform law, but I have learned not to believe it. In the early 2000s, there was talk of the United States and Mexico reaching a comprehensive deal to legalize all undocumented immigrants in return for a free trade deal that would allow private in investment in Pemex, Mexico's state-owned oil company. Those talks fell apart after September 11. During his 2004 re-election campaign, President George W. Bush once again raised hopes of immigration reform to woo the Latino vote, but it was an empty promise. In 2006, we went out into the streets by the millions and our demands continued to be ignored. President Barack Obama won the Hispanic vote in 2008 by promising that in his first 100 days as president, he would put forth comprehensive immigration reform. Once in office, he said he was too busy dealing with the economic crisis to work on immigration reform. Far from being a solution, work permits are instruments of exploitation for immigrant workers on both sides of the border. In immigrants' countries of origin, unscrupulous brokers collect large fees promising to help arrange work permits and then disappear with people's money. On this side of the border, the bosses expose the workers to long, hard hours of labor and unhealthy conditions and without necessary protections. If the workers don't like it, they can lose their jobs and their work permits. Creating a new set of work permits without a real path to permanent residency and citizenship will only legalize the exploitation we live under while requiring us to go to the back of the line and pay thousands of dollars in fines and more taxes for the privilege of being treated this way. But I can't swallow this deception. And I suspect there are many others like me among the 11 million undocumented people in this country who understand what is being proposed and will have no motivation to come out of the shadows to participate in this process. The distrust, the distrust that I feel comes from observing two successive presidential administration, one Republican and the other Democrat. They speak from both sides of their mouth. From one side, they spew words of legalization, but on the other side, they generate more anti-immigration laws, increase deportations, build detention centers and jails, and pour more investments into policing the border. I am over 45 years old, as are many of the people I work with in construction, and it appears increasingly likely that we will not live long enough to be legalized. This is unjust. After almost two decades in this country, there are a couple things I have learned. Firstly, don't trust the politicians. And secondly, it will be through our own ability to organize and collectively fight for our rights that we will see improvements in our lives. Jill Nelson is a writer, activist, and journalist. Nelson was arrested on April 16th, 2020, when she used chalk to write Trump equals plague on an abandoned building in Washington Heights. She was held for more than five hours in jail. I went out to the drugstore and the supermarket, essential trips. I was walking from the drugstore down to Broadway to go to the supermarket. 
when I saw a green boarded up empty for rent building. It was covered with plywood. I had a piece of chalk in my pocket and I wrote Trump equals plague. Before I could even step back, cops swooped in, cut me off, on, made an L. Two cop cars, cut me off, jumped out. What are you doing? What are you doing? You're under arrest. They searched me, asked me if I had any weapons, told me to take my hands out of my pockets. It was a cold day, so I said no. Frisked me, shoved me into a police car and took me to the 33rd precinct where they put me in a cell and left me there for five and a half hours. I took my shoes off. I had had a mask, a fabric mask I had made on, but I demanded that they give me one of their more professional masks. They didn't allow me to make any phone calls. I was never read my rights. It was absurd, absolutely absurd. A total waste of time and energy. And this is in a community that has one of the highest rates of COVID, has many people who are poor and working poor. And there's something the police could have been doing besides attacking me for writing the truth. I have yet to have anyone disagree with what I said. Trump equals plague sums up to me what's going on, how it is, what's happening in this country and in the world. And we have a president who is aiding and abetting and telling us that people of color and older people, we should just die, get out there and die for capitalism. It's ridiculous. There are so many disparities in healthcare, in treatment, in coverage. You know, I think the police are out of control. I think the mayor is afraid of the police. Instead of saying what he ought to say, which is, now I see how you feel, people of color. He's fronting for the police, as always. Apparently, the only person he worries about is his son, Dante. You know, I am 67 years old. I was politicized by the killing of Clifford Glover when I was 18. This notion that it's only a few bad apples, I don't and this, that this isn't policy and that the police are there to serve and protect, I don't buy it. I don't buy it, I don't see it. I can't see how arresting me or rushing down those young men in Brooklyn serves any purpose, it doesn't make us safer. And I frankly feel that COVID-19 has been racialized, really. And it's now being used as a way to further oppress people of color. It's just absolutely wrong. The police aren't doing their job. What a waste. COVID-19 has been weaponized and racialized and is being further used to oppress Black and Latinx people. And we have to resist. You know, we cannot just sit by and act as if this is acceptable or anything goes to survive. It's not enough to me to bang pots and make cheer and clap at seven o'clock every night. We have to, as Norman said, get out there, demonstrate and resist this militarization of our city, of our country, and the racialization of this alleged great fight against COVID-19. I think it is as it has always been in America, open season on people of color. And we see COVID-19 and the stress in the nation being used as a cover for that same thing. It ties into those scenes we see of armed white men with swastikas and Confederate flags converging in front of state houses and demanding that governors reopen. I mean, this is the civil war. With this is just the latest battle. Emily Pierscala is a registered nurse at Hennepin County Medical Center in Minneapolis and a member of the Minnesota Nurses Association who has been, like so many in our audience tonight, on the front lines of the battle against COVID-19.
What is it like being a nurse in the pandemic? Every day I bounce through the stages of grief like a pinball. The ricochet and whiplash leaves my soul tired and bruised. Denial. I have spent less and less time in the denial stage. Still, I see many of my loved ones, politicians and lay persons still stuck in this phase. Anger. When our elders and immunosuppressed folks are referred to as disposable members of society, when the pocketbooks of stockholders are considered more important than human lives, when we've known for decades this pandemic was coming, I burn with anger. Anger at the system that prioritizes profits over health. It's the system that regularly runs out of essential and critical supplies seasonally. I have anger knowing the fragility of our supply chain has been exposed time and time again, especially after the earthquakes in Puerto Rico, and yet nothing was done to reinforce them. Bargaining. The governing bodies bargaining with supply chain availability over scientific evidence. A paper bag is given magic powers to somehow preserve masks that are already expired and soiled. Depression. Heaviness in my heart knowing my coworkers and friends will become unwilling sacrifices to the system can continue in its self-destructive path. And there's grief for the many people I will not have the resources to care for and save. Acceptance. I have accepted that I will be infected with COVID-19 at some point. I'm not scared of getting sick. I'm scared of infecting those who will not survive. I check every day on our state's available hospital beds and ventilators. I wonder, if my illness becomes severe, will there be resources left for me? And then I'm tagged in another social media post praising me for being a hero. And I'm instantly flung back into the pinball machine as my emotions ricochet through the stages. If I die, I don't want to be remembered as a hero. I want my death to make you angry. I want you to politicize my death. I want you to use it as fuel to demand change in this industry, to demand protection, living wages, and safe working conditions for nurses and all workers. Use my death to mobilize others. Use my name at the bargaining table. Use my name to shame those who have profited or failed to act, leaving us to clean up this mess. Don't say heaven has gained an angel. Tell them negligence and greed has murdered a person for choosing a career dedicated to compassion and service. Writer, historian, and activist Rebecca Solnit is the author of books on feminism, Western and indigenous history, popular power, social change and insurrection, Wandering and Walking, Hope and Disaster, including Hope in the Dark. She wrote again about hope as the COVID-19 pandemic spread. The COVID-19 pandemic and economic crisis will not end, if ending means things going back to the way they were. Whatever normal meant on January 1, 2020, it will never return. It's worth remembering that in the past few decades, the return to 19th century robber baron capitalism via the dismantling of social safety nets and the transformation of education, healthcare, and other basic human needs into for-profit schemes that served shareholders first meant that every day life had already become a disaster for too many billions of people before this crisis. There is a long, rough road ahead. 
without radical change, the way food, shelter, medical care, and education are produced and distributed will be more unfair and more devastating than before. I believe the generosity and solidarity in action in the present moment offers a foreshadowing of what is possible and necessary. The basic gen generosity and empathy of most ordinary people should be regarded as a treasure, a light, and an energy source that can drive a better society if it is recognized and encouraged. Mostly it's overlooked, undermined, and sabotaged. Capitalism and its octopus arms of entertainment, advertising, and marketing endeavor to reduce us to consumers. This means making us the kind of miserable, selfish, lonely people who seek fulfillment through buying stuff and believe in competitive, competitiveness as a basic social force. Competitiveness, that driving word behind free market ideology, means we are rivals and there is scarcity. Each of us gets more by seeing that someone else gets less. Competition is the antithesis of mutual aid, which is not only a practical tool, but an ideological insurrection. The fact that even in places like the United States, where these competitive, isolating messages have bombarded us for at least 150 years, millions still reach out in generosity and are still moved to meet the needs that become visible in moments such as this, is testament to something about human nature and human possibility. Those urges are strong and deep, and they can be a foundation for something different. Indeed, they often have been before. Some of that sense of urgency and shared destiny will fade away as it often does after a disaster. But one of the important things to remember is that some of it was here before this pandemic. Sometimes, I sometimes think that capitalism is a catastrophe constantly being mitigated and cleaned up by mutual aid and kinship networks by the generosity of religious and secular organizations by the toil of human rights lawyers and climate groups and by the kindness of strangers. Imagine if these forces, this spirit, weren't just the cleanup crew, but were the ones setting the agenda. What I have seen after earlier disasters is that a lot of people aspire to go back to normal but some find in the moment a sense of self and a sense of connection so meaningful that something about who, we, who they were and what they did in the crisis carries forward into how they live the rest of their life. Sometimes this is as, in, as intangible as a change of priorities and habits and a new sense of agency. Even those who want things to get back to normal often find they are charged they are changed permanently in their sense of who they are and what matters most. The pandemic marks the end of an era and the beginning of another, one whose harshness must be mitigated by a spirit of generosity. An artist hunched over her sewing machine, a young person delivering groceries on his bicycle, a nurse suiting up for the, for the intensive care unit, a doctor heading to the Navajo Nation, a graduate student hip deep in Pyramid Lake catching trout for elders, a programmer setting up a website to organize a community. The work is underway. It can be the basis for the future if we can recognize the value of these urges and actions, recognize that things can and must change profoundly, and if we can tell other stories about who we are what we want, and what is possible. We end our performance with a poetic call to action from the author Marge Piercy. What can they do to you? 
whatever they want. They can set you up, they can bust you, they can break your fingers, they can burn your brain with electricity, blur you with drugs till you can't walk, can't remember, they can take your child, wall up your lover, they can do anything you can't blame them from doing. How can you stop them? Alone, you can fight, you can refuse, you can take what revenge you can, but they roll over you. But two people fighting back to back can cut through a mob. A snake dancing file can break a cordon. An army can meet an army. Two people can keep each other sane, can give support, conviction, love, massage, sex, hope. Three people are a delegation, a committee, a wedge, with four, you can play bridge and start an organization. With six, you can rent a whole house, eat pie for dinner with no seconds, and hold a fundraising party. A dozen make a demonstration. A hundred fill a hall. A thousand have solidarity and your own newsletter. Ten thousand, power and your own paper. A hundred thousand, your own media. 10 million, your own country. It goes on one at a time. It starts when you care to act. It starts when you do it again after they said no. It starts when you say we, and you know who you mean. And each day you mean one more. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching to you, the nurses, for what you're doing now and always. Thank you again to our wonderful performers, Bluebird, Stacey Enchin, Megalyn Echikunwoke, Diane Guerrero, Ben Harper, Brian Jones, Simone Misick, Kendrick Sampson, Wallace Shawn, Lily Tomlin, and Jesse Williams. Solidarity. Thank you for joining us tonight. We'll return in the morning at 9.30 a.m. Pacific Time.